My name is Paula Osset and I work at the Flanders Marine Institute. Uh, we coordinate the Immunet Biology portal and we also participate in the Sea Data Cloud uh, project. And my colleague Ruben Perez is the one that is in charge of the over there in the for the remote uh, assistants or participants. Uh, so he will be replying to the to all the questions in the blog and if if something is interesting for all of us, he will raise their hands and so that we can all see it. Um, so uh, for today, do you hear me well? Yes. No. For today, um, first I would like to introduce uh, you to the marine biodiversity landscape. I think usually here in the Sea Data Cloud, there's fewer people that are familiar with biological data. So perhaps, any, can you raise your hand if you if you usually work with biological data? How many of you? Um, apart from please. <laughs> So usually um, there's fewer people that are uh, dealing with biological data. So we will first talk a little bit how we are organized in the marine biodiversity landscape and a basic introduction to how usually data is collected because it's important or it will be relevant for the fewer sections where we explain what sort of quality checking we do in, for biological data. And in the same or for the same reason, we will explain a bit uh, what's the standard, the data standard that we use in biology um, because it's related as well to the online QC that we perform to the data, but it will be very basic. And then we will do a demo of the online quality tool and then we will explain a bit what are the links between Immunet Biology and the Data Cloud project. So this is the, in a nutshell, the uh, the landscape where we have uh, the data providers on the bottom. So some of the data providers or a big majority of the data providers will give us the data through IPT, which is a, a online and open source platform to share biodiversity data. Uh, but you can do it also via CDATANET and there's a specific adaptation of the ODV format for that. Uh, and we also accept, I don't know, just Excel files or, or CSV or, for, or data in any other format that we will apply the transformations needed and we will standardize. And then from there, it flows to Eurovis, which is the European node of OBIS. And Eurovis is really just the data system behind Immunet Biology. And it's uh, the European node of OBIS, which has uh, data at the global level for marine biodiversity. But it can also flow to IPT, uh, sorry, to GBIF, which has biodiversity not only on marine uh, environment, but also terrestrial. So all of these initiatives share the same data format and standards. Um, and then for the Eurovis, it flows to immune biology. So biodiversity is usually, uh, well, what we understand for biodiversity is how much variety of life is found in a place. Um, and usually we just measure or we count this as the number of species that appear in an area at a time. So that's the basic information that we usually collect for biodiversity is what, what species, where they're found and when. But obviously uh, studying biodiversity and the evolution of biodiversity is much more complex than just which species appear. And we need additional information to understand the ecosystem and what are the impacts or what are, how the ecosystem is, is evolving. We need um, additional information such as um, quantification, so how many species or how much of these species were found. Uh, but also some other information about life traits, such, for example, uh, the length as an indication of the age, which in turn is an indication of the sexual maturity of the species or the specimen found. Um, and then which environmental conditions were found. It's important to understand why some species are there or not. And uh, very importantly, how they were collected, because it will determine the absences that we have. So I put some slides about uh, the classical um, sampling methodologies in biology. And I see that for some reason, the second part has disappeared, but OK. <laughs> um, this is for pelagic, which is uh, organisms that swim in the water, in the column. Um, so we have this type of systems for, for example, pelagic trolls or nets for zooplankton. Um, and it is very important to know what type of net and for how long it was deployed and at what speed and things like that because some species will appear or not depending on, on this. Uh, for um, 
organisms that live connected to the seafloor or buried or just on top of the seafloor, we have other types of instrumentation such as the bottom troll, but also grabs. Um, again, we need to know how much surface was sampled for how long and or the, the speed as well, the surface that was collected by the grab or the surface of the grab and so on. And then we collect uh, or we record additional information, uh, information such as life stage, the length, as I said, or the length of a specific feature of, of the specimen, uh, biomass and abundance. And then we want to collect environmental information such as temperature and salinity, very important for plankton in communities or pelagic communities. Pigment nutrients, we can collect this in the Niskin bottles. The same, we can analyze the same um, sample to, for example, uh, identify the phytoplankton species. And for um, benthic organisms, we want to have sediment characteristics as well. And then, as I said, it's very important to record how the sampling was done in order to know whether a species is pres was absent because it really was an absence or because um, the sampling methodology is not the appropriate to capture the species or because it wasn't targeted. Uh, so these are things that we, we want to have in the data as well, not only in the metadata. So how do we capture all this complexity? Well, here I come to the data standard, which is the Darwin Core, is the biodiversity data exchange format uh, that all of these initiatives that I showed in the first slides, uh, so all these, uh, this IPT, GBIF, all of these share the same data format, which is the Darwin Core. And basically, Darwin Core is just three tables. Uh, one is called occurrence, the other one is called event, and the third one is called extended measurements or facts, which we always name as IMOF. Um, and what happens with this format is that we normalize the data into these three tables, and then we apply control vocabularies for the uh, headers, for the field names, but also for the content. And I will talk a little bit more about that. So Darwin Core is this schema that was well, that is shared by different biodiversity initiatives and it's just a, a schema that is based on a core table and then extensions. And in our case, uh, for immunity biology, obvious and so on, we use a, a extension, two extensions and one core. The core is called the event table and here we're going to collect all the information related to sampling. So uh, yeah, when, where, so the coordinates, time, depth, etc. Then the event is linked to the occurrence table where we record the taxonomic information, so the species, the list of species that were found, uh, standardized. And then both tables can be, link, can be linked to the third one, which is the IMOF or extended measurements of facts, where we're going to put just basically everything, which is apart from the occurrences, of course. Uh, so uh, information related to sampling, but also environmental information or other uh, quantification, bioto-quantification, such as the abundance and so on, or um, specimen characteristics, such as length. So all the additional uh, information that's not uh, taxonomic goes into the uh, IMOF table. So this is a bit an, an example. Uh, we would put uh, information related to, to the sampling, so the cruise, the station, and of course the coordinates and the time of the sample and so on. And from there, we can link the sample to um, characteristics of the sampling. So which device was used, the area that was uh, sampled, or the depth that it was, if it's a core, the, the slice of the, um, the depth of the slice, for example. Uh, we can also indicate brain size and so on. Other environmental characteristics, so the Vesta, for example, the banding graph, and then we could put information about the sediment types. Um, then, for each sample, we would have a list of species found for that sample. So you would have species one and species two recorded in each specific sample, and for another sample, another list of species, all in the occurrence table or occurrence extension, extension, extension sorry. And then we would have, other, in the same table as that one on the left, we will have other information but related to the species. So we could have uh, biomass or abundance or length, etc. So I also mentioned that we applied control vocabularies for the headers, and these are called Darwin core terms, but I'm not, well, don't need to know uh, all these Darwin core terms, you just have to know that this is something that is checked, whether your data um, complies with these terms or not, and whether the mandatory fields are present or not, or the recommended fields are present or not, this is all checked based on these control vocabularies. 
and this is an example of a data set. Actually, it's the same example that I will show you on the demo. So um, you can see all the Darwin core terms as headers on the three different tables. And we also standardize the content inside the data. And of course, we applied ISO standards for dates and, uh, and so on and so on. But I want to focus on the two specific or discipline specific uh, standard or control vocabularies that we use. One is for taxonomic, which is really the core of what we do. And then uh, the BODC vocabularies that probably you're all familiar with, uh, which we use for the EMOF table. So the table where it has all the additional measurements. So taxonomy, uh, personally, <laughs> not a, an expert in taxonomy. Um, and um, and it's, but it's quite a complicated thing because uh, it's very prone to different variations in the spelling and mistakes because who speaks Latin? No one speaks Latin, is it? So of course there are a lot of spelling errors in the data sets, but actually there are correct spelling variations to the same species. And then there can be really tens and tens of different synonyms for the same species, or even a species that was called two species that were, or one species that was thought to be two different ones, so they gave two different names, but actually it's the same species, so we have different synonyms for the same species. And then on top of that, we have homonymy as well. So the same name can be applied to actually different species from different families and so on. So it's quite a, a complicated thing, and that's why we need standards. Um, not only for just so that everybody knows what we're talking, which species are we actually talking about, and not uh, if you consider uh, the number of species that are present in one place as an indicator of biodiversity and you are including synonyms as different species, of course, you are doing it wrong. So we need for that, but also to, to just enable interoperability, we need a standard. And we enforce the standards with the World Register of Marine Species, which is a collection or a, yeah, a register of all the marine species in the world. And the content of this register is managed by taxonomic experts, editors, that are specialists on a specific family or yeah, a group of species. Uh, so actually there are sub-registers for uh, Nematoda or uh, different, different groups. Um, and then each species gets um, LSID, which is a unique uh, identifier with an electronic um, resolvable link. And all the, all the data, all the species that we have in Immanuel Biology need to be uh, matched with a scientific name ID from worms, which is the LSID. Um, so this is what you would, you would get, a list of species, but we, what we actually need is what's on the right side, which is the standard or the uh, control vocabulary for each species. So we have a tool, uh, which is the taxon match, where you can just upload a list of species names and it will return to you the uh, scientific ID, sorry, scientific name ID, or the LSID. And then you can use us to standardize your data. Um, and then from the control vocabularies, I'm not gonna go very deep into the VODC vocabularies because I assume that most of you for your own discipline will be aware of different vocabularies, but for biology or biological data, we have a few collections that we usually look at. So for example, um, this would be the EMOF table, the Extended Measurements of Facts table, and we would have a specific vocabulary, the measurement type ID. The EMOF table, I didn't mention that, but what we have is an event ID, an occurrence ID, to link to the other tables. And then you would have a measurement type, which you will use a BODC vocabulary to specify which measurement it is. A measurement value, sometimes you can even have a value ID, so for example, if it's uh, life stage larvae. Larvae has its own vocabulary, so the measurement value ID would have a VODC vocabulary. But of course, for numerical values, there are no standard vocabularies. And then you could also have uh, vocabularies for the units. So just to wrap up, um, normalized our data is normalized into three tables: event, the core, occurrence, and uh, extended measurements or facts. And then we applied control vocabularies for the field names and for the content. So what type of QC do we apply to the biological data um, and how to interpret the results that you get from the QC tool? So the first thing I would like to clarify is that we don't really check if you uh, identify the species correctly because we cannot do that. 
So we get a data set and we assume that the scientists behind or the taxonomists behind uh, identified it correctly, but we do a lot of other checks uh, in the data set. So um, I want, I put this slide again because as I said, most of our data providers uh, give us the data through the IPT platform there. So the online QC tool that we have developed is based on IPT resources. So IPT, it's, it's just a platform to share biodiversity data. You can upload your tables there, uh, fill in some metadata and so on. And then uh, you have a catalog you can search. And when you open a data set, you get something like this, uh, which gives you the description. And then you have the Darwin Core Archive, which is a zip file with the three tables that I was mentioning. But actually you can see there at the bottom, well, probably you cannot read the numbers, but you can see how many records the event table has, how many records the extended measurements of facts has, and how many occurrence records we have. So you can already have a glimpse of what's inside the Darwin Core file. And when you download that, you get this zip file with the three tables, event, emof, and occurrence, and some metadata in XML format. And I put the link to this resource um, so you can check it um, as well. And what we developed is an online QC tool that is based on these resources. So just by pasting the URL that I just showed on the bottom, you paste it on, the, on that box, and then it will already and it will do the quality checking for you. So um, I think the best way is if I go on the internet, they still the people remotely still see the screen. Okay. So we have a training resource. We have an, a training instance of the IPT to mess around with data sets. So we have this data set, which is based on a real one, but that we messed up with, with errors and things like that, just to show um, how it works. So uh, you paste the, uh, the, but you can, you can use any other data set, but I will use this training resource. So if you paste your URL here uh, and you load, depending on the size of the data set, it will take um, longer or shorter. So the first thing you get is this tab with the data overview. So um, this is very similar to that bottom part that we showed on the IPT. So you get, um, maybe, is it readable or? How can I make the zoom here? Claudia, how can I? I don't know how to do it with Mac. It's better, maybe? Okay, so you get an overview of what's in the data. So here it says that uh, we have 27 events, so 27 records in event and, and 40, uh, over 400 occurrence records. Um, if you scroll down, it will give you a summary of what's a little bit more detail, what's in the data. So for example, you can see, I don't know if you can read it, maybe you have to trust me, uh, what type of gear was used to measure, but actually this is not correct. We will see later that, yeah, you should really have a measurement type ID. We'll see that later. So it's something instrument name. Um, another parameter that is present in the data is the horizontal opening of the net the vertical opening of the net, and you get the min and max values. Um, trolling speed, so you can see that they were trolling all the time at 2.7 knots. Uh, the mesh size of the net, which is important because some, some small animals can go through, of course, so you need to know this uh, to see, to understand what absences are in your data. Um, and so on, and then you have other quantification for the biota, such as abundance, so this will be linked to the occurrence table, individual count, um, biomass. Then you have here, uh, obviously, uh, something that we put, abundance per something, which is a wrong record that we put in there, and uh, sex or gender and life stage. Then you get um, an overview of what of those measurements are actually standardized to uh, VODC vocabularies, and in this case, life stage and sex. Uh, sorry, the values themselves, uh, not not the parameter, but the value. And in this case, it's uh, life stage and sex that have been the values have been standardized. So you have adult and females that are standardized. 
Then you get a geographical cover of the data set, so you immediately see that there are some points that are not correct. You can click on them and see what's going on. It will give you a warning or a message of what's the, the error. The temporal cover in this case is just um, 2009, but what it does is it checks the temporal range in the data itself and compares it to the metadata. So you can also see that your metadata says is maybe 2010, but actually the data inside is from 2009, so it's, it's a good visual check. And then it gives you the taxonomic cover of the data set. Um, but then we really go into the issues. So if you change your tab from overview to issues found, um, you get an overview of all the different errors or potential things to improve in your data set. So um, it will tell you, for example, that it has found 26, so you have a count called in here, it has found 26 duplicates uh, in the EMOF table. It will tell you that for three records, uh, you have said that the uh, abundance, probably abundance or biomass, is zero, but you actually said that the species was present. So it's impossible that if the species was present, the abundance was zero. So it will tell you, it will give you a warning. Then it tells you coordinates are on land or the event date is not in a valid format. Um, it also compares uh, the depth that you mentioned in the event table, which is bathymetry layer, and it has there a buffer, I think it's 150 meters. But if the difference between your depth and the bathymetry depth is greater than 100 meters, it will give you a warning because perhaps it can be that your depth is wrong, but it can also be that your coordinates are wrong. And then it will give you also some other warnings. Um, so related to uh, fields that are uh, mandatory and that you didn't fill in, so empty value for required field and so on. Marine taxa that is located on land, which seems quite unlikely. Um, and then, for example, scientific name ID, you have put something there that does not really resolve to a valid uh, ID. Or even that it's just empty, you have not filled in the scientific name ID, which is a required field. Then it gives you, this is a general overview, but then it goes into uh, the different tables, but it's, it's also at the top. At the top. Um, so it will tell you um, that you have this measurement type, which is the mesh, mesh size. Um, and it tells you that you, have, you haven't provided a measurement type ID. So you have given, this is my parameter, but you haven't, uh, you haven't given um, a control vocabulary for it, which we need. Um, and it will also tell you uh, that maybe you have provided a value that potentially has a value ID. So there is a collection with different uh, sampling devices. Uh, so you can probably assign an ID to that measurement value. So we want to have, it's not mandatory, but we recommend to have an ID, of course. Measurement type ID is mandatory, measurement value ID is not, but recommended. Um, and then if you put, again, similarly as with taxonomy, if you put uh, an ID that you just made up or you copy pasted something wrong, or it will tell you that it does not really resolve to an actual uh, control vocabulary. Um, it also gives you a detailed overview of what's wrong with your taxa. Uh, so you have here some, indeed, if you see it from, from this table, um, there are, sorry, from the one um, above, this and this, 5 and 43. Here's a little bit more detail where it tells you what's wrong with some of the scientific name IDs that are do not really match or you just didn't fill in. Um, and then all the marine taxa that appear on land. Uh, you can visualize again your your uh, issues on the map. And then it goes table per table. So you can visualize each record that has an issue and um, just expand it so you know which uh, event or which record it actually corresponds to and it will tell you what's wrong with it. And the same for occurrence and the same for the EMOF. I'm not going to go into detail with the hierarchy, but this is just a well and feature of the format where we can reflect the sampling hierarchy. So we have subsamples or slices, 
or things like that, we can reflect it in the table and this will check that your hierarchy is correct. But um, it's not at the moment relevant for the seat of the cloud because at the moment we only deal with occurrence core data sets. I will just go over that in a minute. So you can actually download the report and see what's wrong with your data. And because you will have the IDs in the report, you can also just match it with your original data and see and flag the records that are roaming work over them. And then you would just repeat the process. You will upload it to IPT, run the tool, and when you don't get any error, you're good to go. We can harvest the data. So um, was this in Firefox? Ah, yeah, here. So I think I just put a few slides in case it didn't work or it was some issue. But these are some of the, so just to summarize some of the QC checks, uh, the first thing that the tool will, will do, of course, when you copy paste the IPT URL, it will check if it resolves to a public resource or not. And it will check whether the, the files, the right files are inside the occurrence table. It's the only table that's absolutely mandatory if we don't have a uh, taxon on the data, then we don't, we don't have anything uh, about biodiversity. So the occurrence table is the only one that's absolutely uh, necessary or mandatory in the Darwin core schema. Um, and then it will check if all the required and recommended fields are present and whether there is a value inside or not. Um, I show you this table. Uh, so it also checks some integrity, it has some integrity checks. Um, so whether all the IDs that you have in one table correspond to IDs in another table and, and so on. Um, and then for the three different tables, and then it will check for duplicates. And it will do that in a different way, whether your data sets is uh, occurrence score. So basically you only have the occurrence table. Um, whether it's event plus occurrence, so you have your sampling information in one table, you have normalized your data into a table with sampling information and a table with species, or if you have the three tables, or if you just have occurrence and another measurement of facts. So the Darwin core is very flexible. Um, you always have one central table and extensions, but not necessarily you need to have extensions. So because there are so many possibilities, it will check for duplicates, taking into account all these possibilities. Then it also checks uh, coordinates that are on land, but it applies a three kilometer buffer for S because we don't use the most detailed uh, shapefile for that because it's very heavy. So it applies a buffer for estuary or coastal, coastal areas where species can be found a little bit what's considered inland, but it's, it's probably just uh, maybe brackish water. Um, it checks depth, whether the depth that you indicated it's, uh, corresponds to the depth by, by the bathymetry for that position. It checks the format of the, of the date. Uh, and as I said, it compares the date range in your data with the date range you provide in the metadata. Um, and then it does these checks related to the um, taxonomic standardization. Uh, we saw some of these errors or some of these warnings as well. It, then it goes into the IMOF table and it will check basic compliance with the BODC vocabularies. So whether measurement type ID is missing, missing which is mandatory, or if it does not resolve, uh, it will check um, if measurement value or if some measurement values that you have put in there, such as, for example, uh, larvae for life stage, it will tell you, well, actually, you could probably provide a measurement value ID as well. Um, so we will check if it's null or uh, if it does not resolve as well. And then if you haven't provided any measurement type ID related to sampling information, it will warn you because we do really want to have uh, sampling information or sampling protocol in the data. Um, and then it will also check, we saw this, if you had say that the species is present but then you gave biomass zero, it will tell you this is impossible. And then it allows to visualize all the, I showed this, all these errors per table at each record. You can export the QC and the hierarchy, you can check the hierarchy. Um, and then there's another tab that I didn't show which lists all the QC checks that are done. So you can also have a look there and see what the QC is doing and then interpret your results. So, What's 
okay, you will think, what, what is here the relation with Cirota Cloud? Um, well, you can, um, this is the most common way that we get the data to immunet biology, but you can actually provide, um, but I think that many of you don't work with biological data, but if you have colleagues in your institutes that do, uh, you can ask them or they can use C.NET to provide uh, biological data as well. Because in the framework of C.NET, we uh, worked on a kind of adaptation uh, of, for a biological data exchange format, which we sometimes you will see it as BioDef data exchange format but, or BioODV. Um, but at the moment, this is based on a current score. So back in the days, uh, well, we still have many providers that provide data only in an occurrence table, so they don't use the full potential of the Darwin core schema. Um, so they will include the coordinates and the date and everything in the occurrence table together with the species. Uh, and this was really what, what was done mostly in the past, and now some providers are transitioning. So this BODB format, this exchange format, is based on the occurrence table. Uh, we are, I will mention later, we are working into um, upgrading uh, this exchange format, but at the moment it's based on occurrence, so no event for the moment. And this VOD format is um, it's kind of a variant version, which has like ODV, a semantic header. It also has nine mandatory ODV fields, and then it has some specific fields for biology, which are called, uh, nine of them are mandatory, and then there are other conditional and optional fields, and then the quality flags. Uh, so the semantic header that it's common to the ODV format, uh, the first five fields, uh, sorry, nine fields are the ODV mandatory fields, then the uh, um, mandatory fields for this specific, so here you see BioDev instead of BioDV, uh, these specific BioDev fields, and then the conditional ones. So this mandatory fields, uh, you can see them here, and uh, well, you're probably kind of familiar with them. So I will go into the biological ones. So we have, uh, yeah, minimum and maximum depth of observation, which is also something that we have now in the event table, or you can have it in the occurrence as well. Sample ID, uh, sampling effort, and there we can use different P01 codes. Uh, then we have a field, of course, very biological or specific to biology, which is scientific name and scientific name ID. Scientific name ID, of course, you're supposed to use the LSID from the World Register of Marine Species. And then you can uh, indicate the sex or the life stage. Uh, there, there are actually um, codes or uh, vocabulary for this, but this, these are not now in the guidelines. And this is another reason why we need to update these guidelines. Um, then you can indicate the abundance or account. You have other conditional fields, uh, which are not mandatory, but are recommended which is, for example, the time range for sampling, which is very relevant in some occasions, so how long you were trolling, uh, it's, it's very important. Uh, and same, you can indicate the uh, track of the, um, of the, of the trolling um, sample. And then in case there are subsamples, uh, you can indicate it using these conditional fields, subsample ID and subsampling coefficient. Uh, and then you can also indicate uh, sampling protocol or current status, just present, absent. And there are some other optional uh, fields related to some other quantifications, such as abundance or biomass, uh, other biometric, so length, uh, size class, etc. Um, and you can also indicate or um, provide abiotic data using uh, other columns. Uh, so here I put, um, I'm not sure, ah oh, yeah, it works. We have a template, well, we have a template and examples. Uh, this is the general template that you can use and it's available in the CITATANET uh, website. So you can download this template to format the data uh, and you see the structure with the nine mandatory ODV fields. The nine mandatory, uh, if I go right, then I start uh, getting into the uh, more, the mandatory fields for uh, ODV, for BioODV, with uh, some uh, explanations, and etc. to the right. Well, the optional and conditionals are not there, but you can uh, actually have an overview of all these uh, 
the fields that you could eventually use in this tab. Sorry, here. In this tab, and you see whether it's optional for all data types or optional for a specific um, functional group such as birds or phytoplankton, etc. Uh, it's a bit, uh, it's probably a bit small, no? Yeah, so here you have. Um, yeah, the label that you can use in the in your ODB spreadsheet, and then the concept ID, and then how you are supposed to use it. Uh, I see some of you are linking. That's great. And then you have two examples: one for macro bentos data, so bentos living in the sediment, uh, where you can see an example of how this is done. And then if I go to the right, uh, I can see uh, the species, for example, with their IDs. Um, for example, some of them are the, the gender or the sex is specified, the life stage as well. So these are specific fields for, the, um, for, for this format, for this variant. The observed individual count, biomass, and so on. And here there is another example for zooplankton. So, so for zooplankton, I'm not sure if it will be there, but it's yeah, density, so per unit of effort. Normally for zooplankton, we, we really need to know how much water was, or, uh, the volume of the water that was sampled so that we can calculate concentrations or, or densities. Um, so you can have a look at this and uh, the guidelines are online as well. Um, so there's a document in the ODB website, which looks like this, so you can uh, you can check the guidelines on how to provide data, uh, biological data through CDATA.net, and you can always contact uh, us. I put some some uh, email addresses on the end of the presentation. Um, so, what's the current status? So, I first of all, the VODB format, uh, as I said, is based on occurrence. So, the full potential that uh, the Darwin core, event core uh, format provides in terms of capturing all the complexity related to biological sampling and all the additional parameters um, is not fully reflected by the current BODB format. So that's why we want to work in the future to, to update the guidelines. Also, a lot of the current vocabulary that we have been developing or using lately is not really uh, reflected in the, in the guidelines. So we need to update this. Um, and at the moment, what we do when we want to integrate data from CDATA.net into biology, we run a few, well, a series of, of um, manual, but some automatic steps. Um, and we also want to improve that. So what we are working in the framework, what we're doing in the framework of CDATA Cloud, is to uh, work on a transform an online transformation tool integrated in the VRE. So it will do the transformation from the VODV format that we saw. It will transform it into the Darwin Core format. Then it will run the QC checks that we saw. And it will return a report with um, what's wrong with your data. So you can also, as provider, you can check what's wrong in your data and make the corrections. And again, you do the loop. Um, but in the future, we also want to, uh, to update this tool so that it reflects the new, the new, the upgraded BODB format, uh, taking into account the Darwin Core event core schema, um, and that updating the vocabulary, uh, the, well, the collections of vocabularies that we use in biology. So that was from me. Maybe it was a bit shorter than, but it's probably.